In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And what sort of story shall we hear? Uh, it will be a familiar story, a story that is so very, very old. And yet it is so new. It is the old, old story of love. Two lovers sat on a park bench, with their bodies touching each other, holding hands in the moonlight. There was silence between them. So profound was their love for each other. They needed no words to express it, and so they sat in silence on a park branch, with their bodies touching, holding hands in the moonlight. Finally, she spoke. Do you love me, John, she asked. You know that I love you, darling, he replied. I love you more than tongue can tell. You are the light of my life. My sun, moon, and stars, you are my everything. Without you, I have no reason for being. Again, there was silence as the two lovers sat on a park branch, their bodies touching, holding hands in the moonlight. Once more, she spoke. How much do you love me, John? She asked. He answered, How much do I love you? Count the stars in the sky. Measure the waters of the oceans with a teaspoon. Number the grains of sand on the seashore. Impossible, you say. Yes, and it is just as impossible for me to say how much I love you. My love for you is higher than the heavens, deeper than Hades, and broader than the earth. It has no limits, no bounds. Everything must have an ending except my love for you. There was more of silence as the two lovers sat on a park bench with their bodies touching, holding hands in the moonlight. That was uh, from Philip Glass's 1975 opera, Einstein on the Beach. By the way, thank you, Fiona. Fiona's one of the few musicians I know who I could say, can you play something Philip Glass-esque from the opera, <laughs> Einstein on the Beach? And she says, sure, and gets it right on the first, uh, first shot. <laughs> so thank you, Fiona. <clears throat> that wonderful story of the lovers uh, has several interesting aspects of it. Uh, the first of which, perhaps, is that the quality of that rhetoric is familiar to us. We've, we've heard stories like this before, this kind of hyperbole, this kind of thing. I, I love you so much. I love you more than the earth. I love you more than the sky, and so on. What's interesting to me about this rhetoric is it can come across in many ways to us. Uh, you could hear that, and it could come across in a way that was extremely sappy, sweeter than the sort of most refined sugar, uh, sweeter than maple syrup. I mean, it could be so sappy. Or, as it is in, in Philip Glass's opera, it could be raised to these sort of, uh, you know, cosmological sort of heights. I mean, the whole point of having it in the opera, well, actually, I'm not sure the whole point of having this in the opera, but there is this sort of sense in the opera that there's something about love which is cosmic, and it's, it's something that's in Einstein's mind, you know, along with all the numbers and, and everything else, the science. So that kind of rhetoric, though, it has a quality to it which is grasping. It's, it's attempting to hold on to something which is impossible to hold on to. This is the problem of any rhetoric of love, any attempt to describe love. Here's something similar. This is a, a quote from uh, Harry, uh, Henry Nash, who is a theologian at uh, ETS in the States. He wrote this in 1903. By God, we mean the meeting place where the deepest being of things, and the final purpose of things come together, blend and fuse into an irresistible object of interest and trust. And this God, so the Christ teaches us, is not a being who is pent up within his own infinitude. He could not be himself unless he went forth from himself. He is the supreme mental and moral force, invading history and pervading consciousness. And by faith, we reach up to him, making ourselves one with him. 
Mm. It's so beautiful. Again, it has this quality that the rhetoric when we speak about God has this kind of grasping quality as it attempts to describe something yet it's so familiar, an old, old story of love, and yet so difficult to hold on to. And so theologians throughout the ages and the poets and the prophets and everyone has spent thousands and thousands and thousands of years trying to speak of this love. And the doctrine of the Trinity, which we celebrate today, is an attempt to do just that. It's a way of trying to grasp on to this love. It's rather like trying to take a handful of ocean. You know, you reach in and you pick it up, and then it just drains right from your fingers. But for that moment when your hand first emerges from the water, it's soaking wet, and it seems as though you have it just for that second until it drains away. The story of the Trinity is a story of a people's encounter with God over thousands and thousands of years. Our people's encounter with God both the Christians for 2,000 years and before them the Jews for another X number of thousands of years, thousands and thousands of years of people encountering this divine being and re recording their experiences in the Bible and then discussing them and trying to figure out how to make some kind of sense out of them. And in the end, what they have said is that we experience God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as three personalities swinging around each other, spiraling at the center of all that we know to be true about life, the universe, and everything. The church has said that at the heart of what we know about God is relationship, and that relationship is like a family, a father, a son, and a Holy Spirit. The ritual of the lovers on the park bench, one that you probably have repeated in your life at some point, is a ritual that sort of reaffirms the love by trying to make that gesture of grasping the ungraspable. And in church, we do it too. We repeat the ritual of trying to name God with our inadequate words, again and again, entering into poetry, trying to grasp the ungraspable. But I propose to you that that's the very heart of the human nature that God has created within us that the heart of the God consciousness that Nash talks about, you know, when he says the blend infused into an irresistible object of interest and trust, uh, that, that being that we yearn toward, that final purpose of our lives, we are created to grasp that with our God consciousness. So I invite you to join in that activity of the Holy Spirit, that grasping, that attempt to give a name to that which is unnameable. You know, in the Hebrew tradition, the, the actual formal name for God is called uh, the Tetragrammaton, the four letters. And it's called that because it is simply four letters, no vowels at all. It's just consonants. And the idea is that that name was so holy that you would never pronounce it in church or in synagogue. You would, if you came across it when you were reading a text aloud in, in the Hebrew, you would, and you still do this in synagogues, you would replace it with the word Adonai, which means Lord. Right? This is why in the Psalms, in the English translation of the Psalms, sometimes you'll see in the BAS or the prayer book that the Lord will be in all caps, will be in small caps. That's to signify that in the original Hebrew, it was a tetragrammaton. And so the English is following the, the Jewish custom of replacing the name of God with Lord. Right. So uh, there's been uh, attempts to, to uh, you know, assign letters, uh, vowels to that name. So uh, the closest that people come up with is... is um, uh, not Elohim, it's, uh, see, it's interesting, I have a mental block because I don't like saying it. What? I'm sorry? Yahweh. Yahweh, yes, thank you. Yahweh is a kind of English transliteration of it. But, you know, even to get that, I mean, that's a speculation. We don't actually know what those vowels were. They ended up using those particular vowels because in the Latin translation of the Bible, that's what they had used uh, when they described, you know, so, so they just took those and then put them with the English consonants. Um, when we do this, though, when we try to name the great mystery of God, we are entering into that very mystery that poetic effort to know what is love, what is our inmost being. So that was my reflection for Trinity. I'd like to open it up and see what uh, people might have to add to that. <laughs>